I'm asking you to turn to several different readings from the Gospel of John, chapter 14. From the Gospel of John, chapter 14, and verse 13. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. It makes no difference what God does. He always does it for this one purpose, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you would turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's there where we see that God gives gifts severally as he wills. I know people that say they have all nine gifts, but I, I don't see it. I'll be honest with you. I believe they're honest. But God gave to one and to another he gave. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, talking about the distribution of the gifts, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. What I want you to see is that God has given gifts. And God is not an Indian giver. He doesn't give gifts and take them back. It's in the book of Acts where I will read again from the third chapter of the book of Acts. Who you will remember that this is the testimony of the lame man that has been healed. It says, and when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why you look so earnestly on us? It was Peter and John. As though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk. Peter and John met this man that was lame. He was miraculously healed. And the people looked on Peter and John as if they had worked the miracle. Lastly, in the book of Psalms, chapter 115, the book of Psalms, chapter 115, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and thy truth's sake. Would you lift your hands and ask God to help me to preach? Father, I need the anointing of your spirit. I need your help. I need your thoughts. I need, I need you to help me to touch the minds, the heart, and the life of every person that is here today. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You don't have to be an exegete to know that if you just took the scripture that we read, you would be able to get an outline of what I'm going to preach to you this morning. As soon as this impotent man had been healed at the gate beautiful, people began to look on Peter. Now, Peter did tell the man, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of the Lord. And instantly, his ankles receive strength, and people that don't believe in running and shouting in church need the rest read the rest of that testimony of that man, he went leaping and running and praising God into the temple. There is something about this human nature. 
We know when we have needs. No matter what description that need is, we know how we feel. We know how it affects our lives, jobs, and whatever else. Someone will pray with us, and the Scripture says, pray you one for another that you may be healed. And we will look at that individual as if they are the ones that wrought the meeting of our need. God said, I will not share my glory with another. Whatever God does, God gets the glory. We've seen miracles in this church. I don't want to go through it again, but you know that me, I am a living miracle. Every time I see a doctor or a nurse, they look at me, nurses will break down and begin to cry. I have doctors, when they walk by me, they just do this, shake their head, just keep going. You're the ones that prayed for me. You're the ones that sought God for my health and my recovery. And God answered that prayer, but you didn't do it. I prayed for people that God has touched them, met their many needs, but I didn't do it. All things are done that the Father may be glorified in the Son. But if you would read all of this in the book of Peter, you would find that he mentions two things. He mentions power and he mentions holiness. It's going to be important for you to remember that as I go forward. As if by our own power or our holiness, we, this man is made well and this man is made whole. You know, when God does things, he does it in a way that no one would even try to take credit. Who remember when the man was by the pool of Bethesda for 38 years? He carried, or he lay on that cot. He lay on that cot until the waters were troubled. An angel troubled the waters. And the first one in the waters received their healing. When Jesus come along, someone else had already been healed. Jesus said, Take up your bed and walk. A man for 38 years laying on that bed got up off of that bed and began to walk. But he ran into religion. He ran into the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they said, it's not lawful for you to carry that cot on the Sabbath. I believe what he said was, look, if you have trouble with me walking, I didn't do it, man didn't do it, but there's a guy down there by the name of Jesus. He did it. If you've got a problem with me carrying this bed that has carried me for 38 years, you go talk to him. I've seen God do things that people take every kind of an exception to and they want to debate and argue. I believe it's every Christian's responsibility to reason with people. But I don't believe in arguing. I don't believe in debating. You're not going to change them. Jesus said, I couldn't do many great things among you because of your unbelief. He worked miracles, and people said he did it by Beelzebub. Beelzebub is the prince of devils. He said, if I by the devil cast out devils, he can't be that way. To God be the glory for all the great and the wonderful things that he had done. I believe that Peter, well, it's in the scripture, that Peter immediately 
began to talk to that gathering of people, wanting them to know this one thing. I'm a man that used to curse him. I'm a man that used to deny him. I'm a man that the only way I'm here is because he forgave me for my cursing. He forgave me for my lying. I've surrendered everything to him. Whatever. I'm a vessel. Whatever he wants to do through me, he can do it through me. But you're not going to give me any of the credit. All of the credit goes to God. If you watch these television preachers, the ones that still give testimonies, you would think that they were God. You would think that it was by some great ability. But Peter said, not by our power, nor by our holiness, does this man stand here? Now we'll look at several things. I'm preaching to you, and we're going to pray for you here today that God's going to meet your needs. We're going to lay hands on you. Lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover. I want to go back to this power and holiness. I know preachers that make their boast and they live like devils. They live like devils. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Be careful who you read their book. Be careful who you watch on television. Be careful whose tapes you buy. Now, if you know someone that's a godly man, you get it. It'll help you. I know preachers. I've never told this publicly. But when they're giving testimony, they will stand up and just preaching away. And they'll say, I tell you what, about... One o'clock today, I was down on the corner of uh, Maine and Vine to make it up. And I got this thought, I got this idea, I had this whatever. That congregation, he's giving all these testimonies. They're giving, this crowd is going crazy. But what they don't know is he's telling that whore, I'll pick you up at the corner of whatever I said, vine and main or whatever. I pick you up about one o'clock in the morning. You say, that doesn't happen. You need to know that it happens. You need to know the tricks of the devil. No wonder God said, know those that labor among you. Know them. I've been in this too long, I guess. I know a man drew such crowds that they had to go to major auditoriums. I'm telling you the stories, the testimonies, and the people giving their money. I know a man. But when he left the auditorium, which was attached to a shopping center, he left his Bible. He didn't know he left his Bible. So, he leaves. Everybody's getting their stuff and they're leaving. And the host of that revival saw that he left his Bible. So he thought, well, he'll need this. So I won't see him till tomorrow night, so I'll just take it to him. When he took it to him, he was with another man's wife in a motel room. It is important that you and I live for God, walk with God, serve God, 
God will meet our every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But to God be the glory. To God. I've never told you those kind of stories before. And I've got them that reach from here to across the street. You don't need to hear them. I don't need to tell you anymore. You believe me. The reason that Peter brought up power is for a man that has been lame for 38 years to not be able to walk. They knew that it took a power beyond the ability of man. It wasn't out of the workings of a man. So he let them know, yes, there is a power that is required to work this miracle. But don't look on us. And he said, neither was it our holiness. If you don't get anything else out of what I say, let me tell you what. God is good. He supplies our needs. John said in 1 John 2, 1, I would that you would not sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate for the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours, but for the whole world. The woman that was taken in adultery, those people that wanted to stone her to death, Jesus rode in the sand and he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. We serve a loving, faithful God, all-powerful God. But God is not going to work a miracle to prove that he's God. When Elijah met him on the top of the mountain, they said, I tell you what, you call on your God and we'll call on our God. Well, they did everything from calling on that dead God to cutting themselves. God, when he does the work, he does more than what any other power could do. With Elijah, not only was the sacrifice eaten or burned, but the altar was burned. And the water that had been put around the altar was gone. God does exceedingly and abundantly above anything that you can ask or think. When the Bible says, thank you for his benefits, that means things that he's done for you, you did not even know he did it. We're not a bunch of orphans left on God's doorstep. We're children of God. If we're children, then we're heirs. What are you an heir of? You're an heir of everything that God is and everything that God does. There's a lot of people out sick. Some of them, well, these folks over here were sick for two months, eight weeks. My granddaughter is at the home of mononucleosis. If I had the power to heal you, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I'd be out there at that granddaughter's house raising her up, right? They called the other day. She was burning up with fever. I said, let me talk to her. I told Shan, let me talk to her. I talked to her. Just a short prayer. Not a long prayer. Just a short prayer. Break this fever. In whatever it was, five or ten minutes, that fever was broken and gone. I didn't do it. But if you can believe, all things are possible to them that believe. Jesus said, I just couldn't do what I wanted to do because you wouldn't believe me. I couldn't do what I wanted to do. The miracle belongs to Jesus. He's the one that we must believe. Let me say it again. Peter and John may have had more power 
may have been the holiest people on this earth. You know why God worked through them? Because he only works through a clean vessel. That goes back to those shyster preachers. He only works through a clean vessel. I quoted 1 John 2 to tell you that we're not perfect, but we do have an advocate. We do have one that we go to that cleanses us. God is able to do exceedingly, and but when he does, we have to be clean, we have to be washed in the blood, we have to be pure, we cannot be living in known sin. We have to present ourselves. That's what he said. Present yourself holy and acceptable unto God, which is but your reasonable service. When I present myself before God, and I'm holy, you know what the Bible says about holiness? Your holiness is as filthy rags. If you don't know what a filthy rag is, you ask any woman, she'll tell you, because that's what that's in reference to. That's what my righteousness, my holiness looks like in the sight of God. But when God saves us, he makes us a new creation. He makes us a new creature. Adam was a sinner. Jesus said, walked with him in the cool of the day ever since he had made him. God went one day to walk with him. Adam, Adam, where are you? Where are you, Adam? Where are you? Adam that would walked around in the glory of God is walking around with fig leaves. Sin come into that family. Sin come in. It, the book of Romans, by one man's disobedience, all were made sinners. Jesus come. He said, I come to seek and save that which is lost. He gave his life a ransom. You know the story. You know the testimony and the work of Christ. When he comes to your life, he doesn't come to just make you a better cursor. He doesn't come to keep you from cursing all the time. You just curse some of the time. He makes you a new creature. Old things. Old things. That old nature. That old man has been made new. You've got a new set of faculties. You think different. You talk different. You act different. You go different. Because you are now not that old creation. You are now a new creation. The thing that I love about Brother John, that guy... I've told you, but it's been long. That was the most hyperhuman you ever met in your life. He couldn't sit still. He couldn't get enough work. Out here at Huntsman, he fell. His head hit one of those valves. Nothing from here down works. But you want, a, you want a man of faith on your side? Go talk to him. He knows he's going to get out of that chair. He knows he's going to be well. That's not idle thought. That's not make-believe. One time a nurse said to somebody, said, y'all need to quit giving him a false hope. I want to ask you, is Jesus false? Is God a liar? 
So if I says, what if he doesn't get out of the chair? Now, number one, I believe he is. Number two, if he doesn't, he will when he gets to glory. Somebody said that's an out. No, that's not an out. That's a trust. That's a trust in God. I have no doubt about Peter and John being full of power. You know, somehow we get it in our imagination that here we are and somehow we need power. So God's over here and God's going to come and he's going to give us a little bit of power. No, no. God said, all power is given in heaven and earth is given to me. Did not the apostle Paul say that we are in Christ and Christ is in us? He's not going to get a, a thimble full of power and come dump it in. It's there when he wants to exercise it, when he wants to use it, it's there. It's in a holy life. It's in a believer. Somewhere down the line, God does these things for his glory. But you've got to believe. We sing the song, have faith in God. Have faith in God for your healing. Have faith in God for your victory. Have faith in God for whatever it is. Isn't it something that we know that it's by grace through faith that we're born again? And we say that we're saved knowing that Scripture says it's by faith. But you take faith for anything else other than that salvation, and we don't believe in it. We don't accept it. We say, that was for them. Well, I'll tell you what. I didn't live with them. I live right now. And as much as they needed God, I need God. And he told me, cursed is the man that leans on the arm of flesh. You'll get it after a while. He did not save me to trust anything other than him for my Every need. My every need. My every need. Let me tell you something about what I believe with Peter and John. I believe that they became zealots. I believe they became zealot servants for the glory of God. We know all about the missionary journeys of Paul. We know from what the Word of God tells us. You know, just walk down the street in your shadow. Hit the sick and they get healed. Miracles. But I want to tell you, Elijah being a man subject to like passions as me and you, those that had those miracles had to fight the same devil, the same doubt, the same fear, the same unbelief that you have to face. There's no difference. Jesus was a man. Hebrews tell us the man Christ Jesus. He didn't suffer on the cross as God. He suffered on the cross as a man, felt every pain. Knew everything going on. Elijah, man, subject to like passions as us. We need, somebody said, well, tell me, and I'm just going to throw this in. Somebody says, tell me how to get faith. I will. Okay, are you ready? How many of you ready to know how to get faith? Who can quote the scripture for me? 
Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I just answered that question. Did I do okay, June? Thank you. I just answered your question. We leave the Bible. Do you know? It's kind of humorous to me, mainly with the politicians. They go to church once every four years, and that's when they had that inauguration. Every one of them get a Bible, tuck it under their arm, and go to church. To me, it's humorous. We go day after day, some maybe week after week, month after month, year after year, you don't read the Word of God and you wonder why somebody else tells you that you can believe God, but there's no confidence in you. I'm confident that God not being a liar. He said, I'm not a man that I should lie. Neither am I the son of a man that I should repent. But whatever I say, I'm going to do it. Every time I read something in this book that he said he'll do, there's a confidence. There is a confidence. Not a confidence because I can see him or I can touch him or I can feel him. But a confidence that comes by reading the Word of God and the faith is established. The faith is increased. One of her favorite authors is Smith Wigglesworth. It's in the history books in England that Smith Wigglesworth raised several, seven people from the dead. Now you say, I don't believe that. That's the difference in me and you. He could not read. He could not write. I believe he was a plumber. When God saved him, he said, God, if you will let me learn to read, I will never read another line of another book an article or whatever, the longest day I live, but I'll stay in your word. His wife was able to teach him to read, son-in-law. One of the testimonies, he was called to a house of a man that had died. They showed him into the bedroom where the man was laying on the bed. Now, I know not everybody believes this, but I still love you. And Smith Wigglesworth's wife was with him. Went in, they're all boo-hoo and crying. The man's dead. He goes to pray. And his wife said, Daddy, not this time. Daddy, not, no, not this time. He said, unbelief, get out of the room. I believe, get out of the room. Now, before I finish that story, I want to ask you, do you believe in a rapture? Are you going to rapture yourself? They're buried at sea. They've been burned to death. They are in every kind of a place of burial. But he knows those that are his. And they're going to come from the north, the south, the east, and the west. They're going to hear his voice and they're going to come up. They can't raise themselves and you can't raise yourself. If you believe that he is going to raise your great, great, great grandmother that's been dead for 142 years, why don't you think he can raise a man that's been dead for several hours. The power's the same. The ability is the same. He prayed. 
and walked out of the bedroom being accompanied by the men that had been dead. I've heard stories I don't believe. But anything that has to do with a man of God, a man that has the faith, the holiness of a Peter or a John, I believe God can do anything. We need to learn some lessons. And those lessons are we can do nothing. But there's nothing he can't do. You, come here, let's sing a chorus. Let's sing a chorus. They're going to sleep on me. There is nothing, no nothing, my God can't do. Stand and sing it. Come on. I want you to get move around a little bit. Sing the song. There is nothing, no nothing. There is nothing that my God can do. Sing it one more time. Sing it with faith believing. There's nothing, there is nothing. Wonders. There is nothing. You may be reseated. Thank you. I've preached to you in the past. The greatest testimony in this church. Some were harlots, drug addicts, alcoholics, thieves, murderers. There is nothing that has not been represented in this church. A man that used to sit right there about halfway back, maybe on the same pew or one pew behind where Sister Versa is. Brother Clinton had preached. He walked out that door. God had dealt with him. He had been convicted, but he wouldn't surrender to God. Married to a lady in this church. Walked out that door. When they got under that carport right there, when they went out those double glass doors, he looked at his wife and he said, I am the instrument of destruction in the hands of a living God. I've gone too far. CBS, ABC, NBC, all the rest of them reported that there was a man that had become a serial killer. He used to sit right there. The greatest miracle of God is to forgive you, save you, make you a new creation. If he can take a broken life. I told you about when I was preaching down in uh, Referial, Texas. Man come through. The pastor and I were talking. Man come through one day and he said, Pastor, I just can't live this life anymore. I, I, I'm just, I, I just wanted to tell you, I'm going to backslide. I, I'm going away from God. And that pastor gave him the strangest answer. He said, well, me and the evangelists, we're going to go to the post office and get the mail. Before you do, would you take time to go to the altar and thank God for all the th things he did for you? Well, after we got the mail, he decided he needed to buy a little paint. So we go buy a little paint. Then he decided it's about time to go eat, so we go eat. When we get back, that man is still in that altar. He's still thanking God. He's still praising God. Still giving God the glory.
for the great and mighty things. Every one of us need to know this one thing. Not one good thing ever happened in your life. Did you do it? It's because God loved you. It's because God gives good things. I'm going to close in just a brief moment. God does. He's not a showman. He doesn't do things to show off. But when he sees us in need, whatever the need is, somebody says, when are you going to get the, use, the full use of your legs back? Just watch. Don't miss a Sunday night or a Wednesday night or a Tuesday or Thursday morning. It may be then. I've got the same trust as Brother John does for himself. But there's one thing. God does what he does for glory. All things are done that the Father may be done, may be glorified in the Son. When Brother Clinton was preaching to that 60,000 in Zaire, Africa, Congo, that one man was going to attack him, injure him, had a liquor bottle in his hand, come up around the side of the platform had that liquor bottle in his hands. Drew that liquor bottle back to throw it and it exploded in his hands. That's a benefit. When you're holy, God doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. Entered that man's mind. I'm going to hurt that man. But God said a thousand will fall at your side. Ten thousand will fall at your right hand. The scripture says no weapon formed against you will prosper. We need to be reminded this morning. Brother, Brother Force is still with us, not Sister Force. Sister Force, along with her husband, they used to sit right here where Brother Sister Hoffman are. Sister Force, every now, every now and then, you know, she was blind. But she would say, Brother Robert, we as a church, we need to see miracles. Not speaking of ourselves necessarily. But we have needs. And the unbeliever will come around and say, well, aren't you supposed to be a Christian? Where's your God now? Where's your God now? What evidence, does he know that you're in trouble? The 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, there in that faith chapter, Deals with people that were killed by the sword, burned at the stake, had their children take them. But the scripture says the world was not worthy of them. But whenever God in his time and in his way chooses to work a miracle, it's an evidence that what I couldn't do for you and what you can't do for me there is no limitation and no inability in him. If I was going to have to wait for you to lay your hand on my head, you may be on a journey. You may go somewhere. You may be home. I may go somewhere. I may have to call you at any hour of the night. And maybe you couldn't get there in time. Maybe you couldn't get there at all. But this miracle worker, 
never leaves. He said, I'm not a God that I can't hear. I'm not a God that I don't know. Not only while the musicians come, not only though I'm not through, not only do I want us to pray this morning for people that have needs, I want us to pray that God will build a hedge about us to keep us. This world has gone insane. They have gone insane. I saw where there's 140 protesters from Washington, D.C. at the day of inauguration facing up to four years in jail because they are going to prosecute them. Huh? That's wonderful. When they get to Berkeley and they get to these other places, I believe you have a right to protest. But it's my tax dollar that bought that glass that you broke Figuratively. But everything that you see on the news is lesbian, gay, LGBT. You and I love the gay. We love the lesbian. We love the transgender. We love the LGBT. But they need God. And we want to help them find Christ. That's our own interest, isn't it? But I want to talk to our young people while the musicians play something softly. I want you to listen to me. You are bombarded with that television. You're bombarded with that social media you're bombarded with that magazines television any number of ways that you can name it's out there wide open God loves the sinner but he hates the sin our accountability is to lead them to Christ. But I want to tell you, don't you get, don't you date one? Don't you become the best friends with one? A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You may not have the boyfriend or the girlfriend that you want, but God will supply your every need. He'll send the right one along. This pretty lady over here, June of this year, we will have been married 50 years. I'm almost to the day six years older than her. The first time I ever laid my eyes on her, she was 12. I said in my heart, I'm going to marry her one day. Tell you what, I thought I was in love maybe several times, but my life, my ministry, and everything about my life in God would have been destroyed if I'd have wound up like that. God knew what I needed. I just practically worship her, and you know that. But we have needs. If you have a need, we're going to pray for you. But if you don't have faith, 
You need to be like the man in the Word of God said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help thou mine unbelief. I believe. Help mine unbelief. This is the day to call upon the one that said, Ask of me, and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Somebody said, What's going to happen here this morning? Exactly whatever he wants to do. And we will rejoice in that. You say, what if we don't get an answer? We'll pray again. And we'll pray again. We'll pray again. We'll pray again. Not only will we say words, we will believe. 